want to first of all thank Professor Juan Huerta, who always helps us with these hybrid events and the swivel. And then Juan has an announcement as well. Hello, everyone. My name is Juan Huerta, one of the tri chairs of the Dreamers Alliance. Um, the Dreamers Alliance uh, students will hold an event next Monday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. They will have food, of course, most important. Uh, but they will be creating um, papel picado and uh, different types of arts and crafts. And this is to promote mainly the creation of the first Dreamer Club in a uh, student run in campus that will hopefully take off um, next mm -hmm. spring. So next week, 11 to one at the uh, learning center, right in front of Puma, come grab a tamal or a pupusa and come do some art and learn about how you can become an ally for our students. And now on to Dr. Fonte. Welcome everyone. It's great to see folks here. You know, in the afternoon, we have these events in the daytime. Campus is very busy. In week twelve, of all time to be here. So really, we're excited today to, to welcome our guests. And I'll be very brief, but I do want to reiterate some of the comments. We can't detach ourselves from what's occurring in the world right now. That's what our social justice program endeavors to do, not just to educate but also to motivate us to become active participants in making history and creating that better society. Uh, and, you know, I'll just mention the, a couple things that when we're thinking about history and the structures that we exist in today and how those are made, they are never natural or finite or will exist for all time. The onus is on us in these spaces to come together as a community, to think about how we can better educate ourselves, empower ourselves, and build that better world. And today's story from our speaker is one of those moments in history that is still ongoing here in California, but not far detached from what we're thinking about, you know, what's happening, not only in, in Gaza or the West Bank or in Palestine, but around the world where atrocities are being committed against other human beings where some humans are held in domination, but yet they resist in order to be free. So I'll move and introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Christian Weiss, who is a US labor historian who focuses on farm worker movements, interracial relations, and historical methods. His book that was just published this year, who he's gonna talk about today, we're excited, The Strikers of Coachella, a rank and file history, of the United Farm Workers Movement, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2023, recounts the United Farm Worker Movement through the forgotten farm workers in California's Coachella Valley, where he's focused on Latinx studies, Asian American studies, and US labor and social movement history. He is here nearby. Some of you will be moving on to nearby UC Berkeley. You'll probably be taking classes with Dr. Fife, but today we have him here. So let's give them a, a big round of applause and we'll Thank you. Thank you for inviting for the, the opportunity to be here. I I've been my sis loud enough? Yeah. I I've been I've been a little sick. Uh, and so we had to reschedule. So I really appreciate your flexibility. Uh, this is only my second time giving a talk on this book, and so I'm always a little nervous. <laughs> this always feels a little more intimidating when I'm on the set than when I'm sitting there. Uh, so uh, I, I want to talk to you, so we'll be talking about this, um, but as the introductions noted, uh, a lot of the violence that is happening right now in Gaza is in our minds, uh, and in many ways, a lot of the, the deep inequalities that continue to exist in this country remains in my mind, despite writing a book on the farm market movement. So, uh, so I'll give you a sense of what we're gonna do. So we're gonna, there's going to be some moments for you to talk to each other, just I, just because I, there's only so much you can hear me talk before tuning me out. So <laughs> we're gonna try to, to do some activity, to, you know, to some extent. But for now, I want, to, I want to tell you a little bit about this book. 
Uh, this is a book that took me about 13 years to write. Uh, I used to be a high school teacher beforehand, and I'll tell you a little bit about how I ended up writing this book. But uh, a lot of the arguments in the book is in the title itself. So the striker of Coachella. Uh, so we can begin with the Coachella part of the title. Uh, Coachella, uh, I'm, can you raise your hand if you've heard the Coachella Music Festival? I was at the first one. You were at the first one. Oh, you're dating <laughs> I would not have shared that information. <laughs> <Sorry, I'm laughs> okay. You share whatever you want to share. I was a pioneer. Okay, you're a <laughs> so, so Coachella is, and I'll show you a map in a minute, but Coachella is a valley, or Coachella itself is a city inside a valley called the Coachella Valley. Now this name, Coachella Valley, is a new name that is put on it by American settlers who arrived in the region in the late 20th, late uh, uh, 19th century, so about the 1890s, for about the 19th century. Uh, this valley is a complicated place, and I'll talk to you a little bit more, but that's where I grew up. And it's uh, I grew up in a region that was primarily home worker, uh, primarily working class, primarily immigrant, primarily uh, non white, uh, primarily uh, in many ways distant from the political dynamics or the political powers that were shaping everyday life. So the wages you made, uh, the food you ate, uh, the places you lived in, the schools you attended. So the second part of it is strikers. And usually striker tends to be a set of people. It's almost never just one, right? It's a set of people who are going to stop working at their workplace in order to change some dynamics in that workplace. Usually it may mean that people are going to stop working in order to raise their wages or they may stop working in order to uh, improve working conditions or to improve uh, safety conditions or to get rid of uh, everyday forms of harassment or racism. Some kind of dynamic in the workplace needs to be uh, addressed and for someone to do it by themselves, especially if you're making minimum wage, it's hard to do so. But if you do it collectively, you're gonna be able to change the dynamics. Uh, does that make sense to folks? Fantastic. The next one is rank and file. Rank and file usually means the membership of an organization, usually of a union. And a union is usually an organization of workers that are recognized by U.S. labor law that is then the basis to organize certain acts. Oftentimes you do it by way of contract negotiations, or you do it when the contract negotiations aren't working well, you do it by going on stuff. That makes sense. So in this instance, we're going to be looking at the everyday members, uh, men and women, children, older folks, uh, Filipino, Mexican, but also Yemeni, white and black farm workers who are going on strike in various parts of California in order to improve the wages, uh, create better conditions in the workplace. But as you'll, as you'll talk about, in many ways, it's a way to try to demand a world of their own. Okay. All right, and this is this is the place. So uh, take a take a look at the cover. What do you see? Talk to the person next to you. If you don't know the person next to you, introduce yourself. Uh, give them your name, pronoun, and describe. What do you see? Yes. <laughs>
I am already very happy that you already started talking to me. That's fantastic. Any thoughts? Any observations that you may see? Anybody? No? Okay. Yes. And it's like from what we can see from here. Okay. Yeah. It's like a, it's like sort of like a desert, it's like barren. Okay. Yeah. Barren, desert, sandy. Okay. Yeah. You see like the little waves of the sand that gets kind of created by with the, the breeze or the, the wind. These are some of the smaller mountains in the Coachella Valley. They're not the ones that the Coachella Music Festival usually shows you. And the Coachella Music Festival gives you like these purple mountains and nice palm trees that make no sense. These are on the east side of the Coachella Valley, so it's pointing towards the Palm Beach community. Uh, and to me, these are my favorite mountains. I grew up in the Coachella Valley, and you can see these mountains changing color throughout the whole day because they're facing the sun. And in many ways, this becomes a metaphor for thinking of our positions in the world. Oftentimes, we think of social structures as being clearly defined. You have a clear position in it. And what I'm trying to suggest to you is that oftentimes these structures are shifting. And as they're shifting, they're shifting with us. And then through that, um, they're requiring us to be able to see each other in the process. Now, I didn't pick this cover. You know, professors don't usually tend to pick their covers for books, unfortunately. Uh, this cover is a photo that was taken of the Coachella Valley in the early, early 20th century when the region was being described as a desert wasteland, as a barren land. But initially, these languages about the land as being uh, uninhabitable, as, uh, as outside of history, as regions that are no longer, they're not productive or not being utilized. Those languages, those, those discourses around space are often languages that are being directed against indigenous people. This is a language that is being used, this idea of a, of a, of a land without a people or a people that weren't able to produce the land in a very efficient way. So I was really problem with, I was really upset with this photo for the longest time. Over, we'll talk a little bit more about what this means and how we can re, retake some of these images. But part of what I want to sh we'll talk about is that the way that Filipino and Mexican workers are being treated in the Coachella Valley were in conversation by how indigenous Korea people were being treated in Coachella Valley before. So if you want to know about farm workers, you got to look around at Native American studies. Okay. And so when we're thinking about solidarity, part of what we're asking is asking, in fact, you can take a look at yourself. You're an incredibly diverse audience. And this is, uh, this is part of the task that we have in the 21st century, to be able to speak to each other and to be able to step up with each other to make sure that we're all living in some ways. Okay. So, but before we continue, the, uh, um, where, where go for the, oh, this one here, right? To, or this one. Oh, oh there we go. So this is, <laughs> I am a Luddite, so I, I am, I'm pretty behind on the times. I, and I have been since I was a kid. You know, the key. I, you know, like, you know, when they bring back the 90s and like writing everything by hand, I'll be ahead of that. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit about my history. My, I, I like to talk about myself. So we're going to talk about me. And then we'll talk a little bit about the book. And then I'll talk to you more on some of the arguments and implications. And really, this is only if we have time. The emphasis here is. Uh, I, I want to introduce as much as I can the United Farm Worker Movement and some of its ideas. And if you haven't heard of them or if you haven't learned too much about that, that's perfectly okay. This is part of what I'm suggesting to you that a lot of this history is still waiting to be written. A lot of the interviews with uh, farm workers are still waiting to be completed. And a lot of the histories of the Central Valley and all these agricultural communities that on the coast like Oxnard and Monterey County and Coachella Valley, a lot of those regions are still waiting to be uh, understood by our state. It seems to me that in California, it's either LA or SF, right? But for me, it's really the coast and the interior. And so this is, so we're gonna be talking a little bit about the interior. But more importantly, uh, me. Oh, <laughs> Talk to the person next to you, which one am I? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, wow. Two Love minutes. <laughs> Keep looking straight. 
education program that was created in the 1960s. It's part of like an anti-poverty program uh, that I think in many ways has gotten really bad uh, or has been stigmatized by some members of our country, but it's actually an incredibly strong foundational uh, process for, for a lot of us. So I have three memories. One was when I was a kid, I was playing in the, break, uh, in the playground and we had this like, what used to be a, like a tire that was kind of like hooked onto this thing where you can ride the tire, right? So it had long, the tire had long broke, had been broken and no one thought it was a good idea to fix it, right? And there was a big rock in the middle. No one thought it was a good idea to remove it. And I remember that we would play a game of uh, playing monkey, like when you're just like throwing yourself and trying to catch the next thing on the, this tower. This, uh... So anyways, I tried to do that. I was trying to be a boy uh, in, as I was gender there. And I fell and I broke my wrist. Right? And it was an interesting thing. Now I think back on it. It's now I'm 40 years old. Now I'm part of the middle class. It's now, you know, some people say I'm up the middle class. I don't feel it, but you know, whatever. And now I wonder how it said that in school that was very loving, was not very attentive to the school grounds around them. I'm not the only one who broke their wrist. Several kids did it too. My brother eventually would get hurt. Other kids would get hurt. And there was just a sense that things were not working well in the school and that there was no real sense on the part of the, the parents that they felt that they had the right to be able to say things need to change. Right. The second one was that I really liked, where is she? Oh, and Anita, right there. You see, this is Anita. Anita had the most amazing blonde hair. And it was straight. And she usually had it not in a ponytail, just in the straight. And I remember I would just comb her hair when we would sit in the, like, a little circle, right? And I remember the teacher pointed that out once. Like, oh, you really like it, Anita's hair. And it was a really interesting moment because it wasn't necessarily like a good thing. It felt like utterly other, even at that early age. And that was because I was a pretty feminine boy. I was already clearly a queer kid, and it would become so as I grew up older. And so for me, this is an early indication to the ways that we're being socialized as boys and girls primarily, and the ways that, that those socializations then carry future visions of sexuality, and that then those need to be uh, disciplined or guarded or controlled. So I grew up in the 1990s when homophobia was as rampant as it is now, if not more so. And, and that really, I think, shapes a lot of my life. And my life. So I have no sense of romanticism when it comes to community or poverty or, or, or race. Right? We all got work to do. That's what I would say. The last one is English. This is all Spanish class, uh, but they were trying to teach us English. And I remember I learned 20 words one time. And I was so fucking tired. I was like, <laughs> I know English. And I ran home, we lived in a small town. This is a town of uh, 1,500 people. And I ran home and I told my mom, I know English. And I pointed to, there's no windows here, but I, I pointed to Na Ventana and I said, window, <laughs> door. And I thought I had known English. And so for many people, many of these students, the two markers of whether you're gonna get out of the lab, or La Colonia in this instance, was whether or not you learn English on normative time, right? Whether or not you made the transition to an English speaking world that you can then signal that you were intelligent enough to be able to get some attention. So, so this is this is 1988, 1989. Throughout the 1990s, uh, the community that I grew up in was, you know, a working poor community, uh, primarily farm workers, making somewhere around the lines of like five dollars and fifty cents. I think that was the minimum wage then. And that's only if you manage to get minimum wage. Uh, I, I used to credit my early math skills to being a boy and figuring out timetables and then calculating what a five cent raise would mean for my parents uh, for the week and then for the month and then for the year. And then I would do it for 20 cents, 30 cents. And the reason why I would do it is because that's the races that they would get. They would get like 17 race rent, I mean, 17 cent race or 33 cent race. I mean, it's the most insulting thing ever, but because there was very limited organization that came back against these minimal gestures of improved wages, uh, people had to accept it. So incredible poverty, uh, incredible exposure to toxins. To, uh, right now, about three quarters of kids in the Fish Valley in the east side have asthma, three quarters. 
it's an incredible number. And you can go to any rural community, you'll see the same things. Oftentimes, we there to be areas that's polluted as in the cities. Uh, let's see, no one had health care insurance. Not one person. We all went to Mexicali. Mexicali is across the US Mexico border in order to go see a doctor. If you had paper, because I was, my mother crossed the border with me, uh, with pregnant with me, but a lot of these kids might not have made it. My mom used my birth control, I'm not her, my birth certificate. <laughs> <laughs> this is a weird Freudian slip right now. I can't <laughs> talk to my therapist. <laughs> Okay, so my cousin was born in Mexicali, uh, didn't have papers, so, and worked three months, of, six months apart. So they used my birth certificate to cross the border for And there's this constant attempt to try to navigate the border patrol. There's a lot of terror, there's a lot of fear, and there's a real sense that you've got to stay quiet to survive. So that's the context. Okay? This is not a surprising context. If you go to the Coachella Valley and you ask people about the divide in the Coachella Valley, they'll say that there's one area these kids who are now my age, and then there's the other area, usually the area that we now hear of, the music festivals, the hotels, the golf courses, uh, the, 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 the tourism industry. Okay. It is this area, this, this dynamic that the UFW is attempting to, to, to address. Now, if you want to, if you're interested in Coachella Valley, these are two awesome books, right? You can read my book for sure, but it's already in your library, so you can just check it out there. But this one is, and these two are trying to document uh, Coachella Valley in the 1980s, 1990s. So this one is of the Chicana movement in Chicana feminism in the 1970s in San Diego State. And it's a bunch of like small memoirs, 10 to 20 pages of activist Chicanas who were in theater, who are from the Coachella Valley and then two other valleys adjacent to the Coachella Valley. It's an incredible, incredible book. And then this one is Rigoberto Gonzalez. He's a nationally recognized poet. I did not know who he was, but he grew up in the Coachella Valley in the farm worker camps of the Coachella Valley. And he's writing about growing up there as a queer boy in the 1980s and the traumas that he's overcoming by way of poetry. So these, these are contexts. Now, when they, they're writing about this in the 1980s and the 1990s, we think Cesar Chavez of this labor organizer that we'll talk about in a minute was actually the boxer of Julio Cesar, right about that, right? And in many ways, this is this disconnectedness mm -hmm. to history. And oftentimes that disconnectedness can often deny us visions for other possible future. And that's kind of what I want, that's what I wanted to do with this book. I wanted to talk to all the people who were part of this union and to be able to collect their stories and tell a singular story that kind of threads together the differences as much as the similarities. Any questions for now? Good? All right, I'm guessing. All right, so this is Coachella. This is the Coachella you know, right? I'm guessing. Like, this is last year. Mm -hmm. like, I'm not going to not come back on you. I think that would be a terror. I don't know. Do people like that one still? Or yeah. See? Yes. <laughs> when I'm cleaning my house, that's what I'm listening to. It makes me feel like I'm living an interesting life. You know, just like, like cleaning my house on a Friday at 9 p.m. Like, I don't know. You're all students, but once you get over that, it's just like cleaning your restroom on a Friday night, like scoring. Like Saturday, you're gonna have a clean house. It's amazing. <laughs> but I'm listening to Bad Bunny, right? So this is this is Coachella. Notice how green this is, right? Notice like it's romantic. Now remember, this is the desert. In order to have that green space, you have to have a relationship to the land that denies it that says the land as it is should not be. The land will become whatever we want to be. This is a land that is created by way of irrigation structures and canal systems that are connected to the Colorado River. The Colorado River right now is being dried up because a lot of the development that takes place in the Coachella Valley in the early 20th century gets replicated throughout the Southwest. Phoenix, Arizona, uh, parts of Texas, and all over California, all of these deserts create this kind of fantasy land a land where you can go to the desert and play golf. This is golf. My father worked in the golf courses, making minimum wage for people who were going to winter in the desert to play golf, where they had their second home. Okay. This is, in many ways, the valley that we see in the country. And it's, in many ways, I think, a really interesting metaphor for the country, a country that is hyper unequal and disrespectful 
to the future. We do not care, it seems, about what's going to happen in the 21st century. So these questions of ecology, right? I was talking to some of the students earlier who were doing sciences. I am in awe of anyone who's doing science or math, by the way. Uh, like, we need your expertise because we're going to have to undo all of the things that the 20th century did in order to be able to find a new future that is not only ecologically sustainable, but that is human. Right? Because ultimately, ecology can often be of service to more repression. So this is what we have. But the Coachella Valley is also a region of farm workers. These fields get the same amount of water, or not get the same amount, but they get the water that also these golf courses get. The fields are also not a viable infrastructure. It is something that gets created in the 20th century through irrigation systems that creates these labor systems predicated on, on pliable, meaning that, uh, that you can force it, uh, flexible labor that is usually paid very little. Okay. Primarily because of that, these laborers are often non-citizen or they're migrant or they're racialized. And the inequalities get worse and worse when you move from men to women. Okay. This is uh, a study from 2013. They would call it the invisible belly. So when everyone else was dancing to that funny, people were trying to get attention to the he said. And this is during the pandemic. I know that the pandemic was really hard on everybody. Uh, and that you saw the inequalities get exacerbated. And you saw some of the hypocrisy of speaking of uh, what do you call them, essential laborers or essential workers, right? All of a sudden, people were essential, uh, and, but they're no longer essential. Right? They were essential for, the, for the, the, the crisis. But as soon as it's over, we kind of go back to, to, uh, to this. Okay. This is where I grew up. This is, Coachella. this is what it looks like. Uh, this is Coachella Valley School District, giving out food for folks. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about this. Okay? And I wrote a, an article on this on the COVID-19 informal person. If you're interested, I can send it over. I, if you, I, I'm going to create like a little sheet of things. If you want, I can just send it over. And some really interesting things I'd like to share. Good? All right. So talk to the person next to you. What do you know about the farm worker movement, the United Farm Worker Movement? <laughs> Uh, what do you know about the food you eat? And what do you know about your Okay, so. What do we know about the food you eat?
History is both uh, a discourse, a language, ideas, things that you write down, or things that you speak, or things, videos that you do. But it's also a material physicality the buildings that you see, the streets, uh, the rivers. And that sometimes there's a disconnect between what we say and what we live, right? And oftentimes we don't have the, like an, a, an alignment that allows us to then be able to change the physicality that shapes our lives. So let's talk about food. Do you know much about where your food comes from? Somebody has to pick the food. Doesn't just happen. Uh, it's magic, kind of is, <laughs> right? Like I go to I go to Trader Joe's and I buy my thing, and I'm like angry at the world about something, and I get some bell peppers, and I get some oranges, and I I mean it's a bounty, right? And somebody had to pick them, right? It was people usually with ideas of their own, usually with frustrations of their own, sometimes as kids, but it's usually adults, but sometimes kids. Uh, it's usually in the U.S. or some parts, but oftentimes they're outside the U.S. Almost, almost the entire food system has an incredibly carbon-intensive uh, industry, meaning that we are eating energy produced by carbon. What about the farmer from the UFW? Have people heard UFW? Some, some no. Okay. Have people heard Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta? What about Larry Ibnian? Okay. What about Pete Velasco or maybe Philip Veracruz? Okay. So some of those are the key leaders that the UFW was part of, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Have you heard of Si Se Puede? Or the English version, Yes, We Can. That's where it comes from. Or like when I first heard it, I was like, come on. And of course, the connection is very clear. Former UFW organizers are part of the UF Obama campaign in 2008. They used that phrase. Si se puede, yes, we can. Uh, let's see, what's another one? Uh, well, we'll talk about it in a minute. Okay, so let's talk about what the UFW is. This is Cesar Chavez, and it's classic image of him. Uh, Cesar Chavez is a Mexican American uh, who was born and raised in Yuma, Arizona, which Yuma, if you think about Arizona, Yuma is in the near border of Yuma, California, and Mexico. That's where my father's from, and my aunts and uncles later on tell me that, yeah, I think we grew up near him. We saw like one colonia, right? So um, now his family gets displaced during uh, the Great Depression. Uh, the Great Depression devastates all communities, but it devastates them devastate them on, in unequal ways. So this is the Yuma's uh, Mexican-American population gets decimated with his property rights. And he ends up working as a laborer, a migrant laborer farmer with his family in the mid 20th century. 
Uh, Dolores Huerta is a little different. Um, uh, she is uh, raised and born and raised in Northern California uh, in Stockton area, so just kind of east of us here. Uh, she is a major organizer in uh, various different institutes and different communities, a teacher, and his, her mother is a small business woman, and so kind of has some of that collection. Uh, these are some kind of classic images, and part of what I use with these images <coughs> is that this is partly what people see in the union, right? Increasingly, we're moving towards recognizing Filipino leaders, uh, and increasingly, there's new data, new uh, material that is recognizing uh, Yemeni leaders who are part of uh, this movement throughout the late, mid to late 1970s. Okay. Now, there is a, so up there, there's a kind of like the march. This is a march that is marching from Delano, which is in Central California, going to Sacramento. They're trying to get attention from the governor of California in 1966. But these marches become emblematic of the UFW, which is in many ways ripping off of the civil rights movement. They're taking on a lot of the same languages around nonviolence, around direct action, around marches, around publicity, and around ultimately getting allies to work with you in order to change conditions throughout their communities. And this is a contract that is organized. This is a major great grower that is forced, forced really, to sign a union contract after a series of strikes. This is Larry Elyon, who is a major, major labor organizer throughout the 20th century, primarily in Filipino uh, circles. And then comes one of the critical leaders in the early 1970s. I'm talking a minute about him. So, this is California, our wonderful, I like to say, our wonderful country. Like, I'm, I'm against all nationalism except for California. <laughs> <laughs> except mine. So, so, this is Delano. Delano is in the Central Valley. Okay, so usually this is called the San Joaquin Valley, and up north is usually called this the Sacramento. But it's all one massive valley. Down south, down here, we have the Coachella Valley. Uh, this is called the Salton Sea. And if you're interested, we can talk a little bit about that. This is the Imperial Valley down here. And this is uh, the Palo Verde Valley down here. And this is where Yuma, Arizona is. So Chavez is here, but the movement begins here. Okay. This is Oxnard. Oxnard is a major agricultural region too. And then down here, you have like, Salinas. Uh, Valley region. It's also a major agricultural region. And then you have up here where you have Petaluma and some of the Northern California floors. So throughout California, you have a almost like a Latin work of agriculture that is not, uh, what would be the word? All agriculture requires a tremendous amount of human labor and transformation of the land. And in California, the transformation of land is predicated on water because well, California is not water rich. Right, where there's no water. Much of the water comes from the north, it gets diverted by a bunch of aquifers and irrigation and canal systems that then feed the entire Central Valley. What this does to agriculture is that it creates these massive, massive companies that are usually, they, they'll cover themselves and they'll say that they're small ranchers or they're small farms or they're small fields, but really they're massive corporations that are trying to move labor throughout the state up and down, up and down, up and down for the harvest. Okay? Because agriculture is not a factory. People think that, that this is the same as working in, the, in, a, in a, some kind of plant. In the plant, you have eight hours or 10 hours or 12 hours, whatever, whatever amount they need to get your, their profit. But in agriculture, it's all about the plant, right? So you may be working a week here, maybe a few days on the next week, maybe a few more hours the next week, and then you have a harvest and you're working 10, 12 hours a day, right? And then once the harvest is over, two to three weeks, people kind of don't want you anymore. Off you go. And then you go to another camp. And then you go to another harvest. And you go to another harvest. You go to another harvest. And then maybe you return back to your, your hometown that is never always your hometown. Right? The Coachella Valley, you can't really see the images from there, I'm guessing. But this is the, the Salton Sea. And it's divided in half. And the eastern end, where I grew up, was the agricultural end. And the west end was primarily uh, a mixture of, 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 of sand, right, and then Palm Springs. And then Palm Springs become kind of like a mecca for, for, for Los Angeles, for Hollywood, uh, for living a good life. And then eventually, you know, Palm Springs diversifies over the years. And there's a lot of different histories that, uh, that evolve from Palm Springs. 
Today, Palm Springs is probably one of the gayest cities in the country, probably the gayest, right? High percentage of, of gay community members, high percentages of, of black community members, uh, Asian Americans uh, in the Palm Springs West Side. The East End remains primarily Mexican, uh, primarily immigrant, heavily undocumented, and heavily policed. Okay. We're doing good? Okay. So the Coachella, so the UFW, so I want you to think back to the early times, so 19, well, yeah, 1960s, right? So think of like high school, right? World War II, when your history class ended, <laughs> right? So, that, that's what happened, right? World War II. So after World War II, this Coachella Valley explodes. Right? Irrigation systems are finally locked in. And uh, Los Angeles explodes in population, Orange County explodes in population, and San Diego explodes in population. And the reason why this is so important is that all those people need to be fed, right? The city needs food. And one of the key areas that is providing that food is the Coachella Valley. Uh, during this time period, um, if you were a farm working uh, person, you were living uh, primarily in, in uh, housing that the rancher controlled, or you were living in public housing that the state government controlled, but that did not provide any real funding for it. So if there were like these little shacks that were really cold in the winter and really hot in the, in the summer, you had no health insurance. You had no unemployment insurance. So if you were laid off, you didn't have any money. Uh, if you had no sick days, I've been super sick. I might be taking a medical leave next semester. I've been super sick for about a year. I have a decent medical leave plan. Whereas the majority of the people, if you're sick, you kind of just work, right? Or you lose money, right? People think that fields are kind of like a nice little campus, like a little like rolling hill and there's like a cow here and there's like some chickens running around. That's not the case. Fields are like miles long. Has anyone ever driven by agriculture? Yeah, so you've seen it, right? They're massive, massive, massive of the same thing, of cilantro, right? Have you ever, have you seen cilantro plants? They're like this big, right? When they first, yeah? Yeah. Okay, you had to, okay, so you have a good sense of this, right? This, and, and it smells nice, but the little plant is off the ground, right? So if you're the person working, you're usually gonna be working with a short handle hole, which is, uh, I can't draw, but it's a hand, handheld little square that is supposed to take the weeds out. And so just think about the power relationship of a professor who is here, just now, to being here, hunched over one foot after another for at least eight hours. We could have used a long handle, but the problem was that it would hurt the plants. So if you're the owner, well, the plants make money, not the worker. That was the argument. Now, this is a field that goes for miles. You're working for at least eight hours, at least. Uh, let's say you need to use the restroom, right? There are no porta potties anywhere. Now, this was a choice again. This choice meant that if you are anyone that is a human, and have any kind of biological needs, because that's what we are, we are biology, right? we're not just machines. But there was no way to use a restroom. The only way you could is that you would have to ask people to kind of line up around you so they can provide protection. So privacy. Usually this was for women, because men, right, even if they were just coworkers, even if they were relatives, even if they were neighbors, would start to still try to use the opportunity to sexualize women, to harass women, and to then alienate them further from the workplace. Now, the reason that this exists, this world, the UFW would argue in this time period, is because farm workers didn't have any real substantive power. And that this lack of power allowed the labor, the, the, the owner of the fields, to do whatever it wanted. One of the arguments that many people have made around power is that the more power you have and the least checks and balances that they, they have on you, uh, the more you may be great as a person, the more you may try to get an extra buck not to have a work party, the more you may force people to work a little harder uh, without any breaks, the more you use the short handle hole and not the long handle hole. <coughs> that makes sense? So, let me, let me go to this, this one here. 
So this is what the union said. Bomb workers sitting, uh, being set upon by the growers. Now, I, in the book, I talk, talk about ranchers. Ranchers doesn't really make sense, but I kept the name rancher uh, because in Spanish, in Spanish, the, the word is ranchero, and it kind of draws on Mexico's history with, uh, with ranchos there. And so they were said that ranchero owns the cops, owns the judges, owns the school boards, owns the water board. And through that, they're able to kind of harass and cow down the workers. There's a lot of work that's being done on how this actually gets done because power kind of moves in very specific ways. It's not just generic. It's not like an abstract idea. I will oppress the farm workers. It's usually through schools. It's usually through, um, through housing. It's, it's through the cops or through the police, through the courts. And the argument is that these folks can organize and go on strike and get attention from the rest of the country in order to be able to create a world that what they would argue was uh, just dignified. Someone standing up, this is a short, long handle hold, kind of referencing Mexican Revolution. This is some of the stuff that's, these are woodcuts are from Mexico's Revolution. Uh, standing man looking into the sky, almost like he's inspired by the sun, right? This is a philosopher, a worker, not just a worker. Now you notice that it's still heavily gendered, it's still the man laboring. It's a, and presumably, his wife and child in the background being taken care of by the masculine figure. This language will stay in the UFW. And this is much of the language that a lot of women members are going to be fighting on. Uh, that's what I try to emphasize in this book. Right? So, does that make sense? How are we doing? Five minutes? Okay. Fantastic. We'll so, have Q &A. Yeah. Is this interesting to you? Yeah. All right. Okay. So, this is what I want you to do. What do you see? Talk to the person next to you. One minute, you only have five. Else? 
it is a long day. Kevin. Nice to see you. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> there's some heaviness to these photos, right? I mean, when I saw uh, uh, there's, you know, I, I think of, of this, I think mom of this book, or this person I'm gendering. I mean, there's a haunting look to her face. Uh, I'm thinking of what's up here, like this boy kind of covering himself like a little shy kid. Uh, do you notice that there are no captions to these photos? There are no names, there are no stories, there are no quotes, there's no context, there's no real sense of who these folks are. What we all get is a canvas. Right? And this is, I think, a pitfall to our show. When you start thinking about the movements that you're going to be a part of, and all of you are going to have to be a part of some kind of movement, I promise you. Oftentimes, when we want to be able to support others, we often project our visions for them. And it's usually about ourselves, that projection. Right? So part of what I wanted to do in this story is that I wanted to write a little bit on who these folks were. And it's been really hard for me to figure out who these folks were. I can never find them except for the young woman in the top with the sombrero. That's um, uh, Amalia Uribe, that's her name. But then she took on the last name de Aslan. And Aslan was the language that was used in the Chicano movement. She's from Colima, uh, Mexico, which is kind of like in the Pacific, almost central, almost kind of going south of Mexico. Uh, she was came to the US as a 10 year old. Her father was a bracero. If you don't know what a bracero is, it's a labor migrant farm worker system after World War II. And I can talk to you more about this if you'd like. And she ended up going to John Kelly Elementary School, where I was a very, very dashy young boy. <laughs> she went to the same school many years later. And she said that when she was a kid, it was understood that she was going to be a farm that she knew that as a child, that very early on, there was no option to leave. This is a theme I heard over and over and over again, this idea of being in prison and incapable of shaping the world according to your needs and desires. She said that she became, she drops out, she leaves school when she's in middle school in order to help her family make money because her older brothers were being conscripted to fight in Vietnam War. So think about the connections. Right, if you're a Chicano, Chicano studies person and you're thinking about the UFW, for me it makes sense that you have to consider Filipino American history, you would have to consider the US involvement throughout Asia, especially in Vietnam. They're, they're, not, they're not not linked, right? They're always interlinked. And she said that she became a, a striker in the UFW precisely so that she wouldn't be a farm worker. She said she wanted to do other things, she wanted to travel, especially. She went to travel to little towns, that's what she said. Now, she is from a little town, I'm from a little town, but she wanted to be in a town of her choosing, where she wasn't gonna be guarded over as a young woman, where she wasn't gonna be typecast only as a farm worker. And ultimately, I think she wanted to be able to see the world. And that's kind of what the UFW does. See the world and make the world see you. But you do it collectively. So, that's what the book is about. Okay, it, it covers a lot of things, but you know we won't have time. Um, why are we fighting for? It's all about the children. A lot of chapters. I like I said, I like to talk a lot, so I wrote a lot. <laughs> but I promise you that it's really readable. I, I was a high school teacher beforehand, and I've always wanted to be a writer since I was a little boy, and so I worked really hard to make sure that this stuff was then an academic boring read. Much of it is about all of these voices. Uh, these are people who I hang out with too. I got drunk with one of them recently, <laughs> and then I was sick for like a week. <laughs> so obviously, I could not handle my beer. Uh, but first, we gave her, that's a good thing. Uh, and, and, and it ends chapter 10 a bit with, and with my life and my parents' life, and, and essentially what do we do with a history that is still very painful because the conditions in the fields remain abysmal. Right? And so the question that becomes not only 
why did we not get the freedom that we deserve? But also, what are the next steps? Uh, what are the next sober steps? Oftentimes what I see students is that they think that freedom is just a step away. One more march, one more fucking protest, one more. Now, it's 50 years at least. So think of your careers, think of 50 years. What is it that you're going to contribute? And that's, to me, that's what this thing is about, right? This, this union. Does that make sense? All right, let's see. Questions? It looks like I'm selling books. <laughs> <laughs> this is my mom's home. <laughs> All right, that's, that's it for a bit. This is good, right? All right. Are there any questions? Yeah, any questions? You want to talk to I, each other while you figure I out? I do. Why? I do. Oh, you do? Okay. I did great. How did I behave today? How did I, how did I behave today? Great. Okay. Is it over yet? Okay. We're having, we're having a trouble hearing you. We'll get right back to you. Can you hear me? Okay. All right, folks. So we're gonna open it up in Zoom land and in the space. We have a great turnout for you know this event, and you know this is amazing history, right? One of the things I didn't mention about Professor Bikes, we met, we've known each other. We met about over a decade ago. We we're both working on our dissertations and in the greatest city in the world. He went to a school that you know we won't hold it against him. He was over at USC, I to go to and UCLA. I was at the public. I couldn't go. I was at the public <laughs> brewing. They were so, more competitive. That's what it was. <laughs> so we're in the same town, but we actually met in Washington D.C. We were both working on our dissertations. Yeah, through the, through being funded through the Ford Foundation. Uh, so great. Who's got a quote? Who's first? And it could be about anything. It could be about graduate school. I used to be a high school teacher. It could be about teaching. It could be about anything. I mean, this is a, well, yeah. about securing yeah. festival yeah. tickets for next spring. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll come around. Anybody have a question? I, I actually have a question. Okay. Oh, we can go with you first. Go ahead. My name is Jag Mishra, and I was, I was just curious. Like, I know you're a professor at UC Berkeley. Yes. What, what would you say, like, the biggest pro is about just being a professor at UC Berkeley? Like, what does it enable you to do? Maybe talk oh. about. That's a fantastic question. So we were just having this conversation earlier. That's a great. So I there are a lot of there are a lot of things that I like. So one thing that uh, Berkeley offered offered me was a bit more time to finish the book. Uh, uh, finishing a book is not about intelligence. We all have the same intelligence. Uh, this is one of the worst things that anyone could do would produce this idea that intelligence is a spectrum. But it is about time. It takes up a lot of time to be able to think about ideas. Think about how, how long it takes for you to write a paper. The, the struggle to get there, the struggle to make it clear, the struggle to be able to kind of finalize it. So I had a lot of time to be able to write the book. And, and that was a huge, huge gift for me. Uh, second one is that we have some incredible students. Uh, we have a lot of first generation students. We're diversifying our campus a ton. Uh, we have very, very, very vocal students, even sometimes when they're vocal with me. And there's an inspiration to that. There's a sense of, uh, of things being done that's really key. Uh, and then the third one is that it, it, it opens doors. You know, this is the unfortunate thing about inequality. It, some, some doors are open and some doors are closed. But right now, it's important for me to be able to leverage whatever doors I have to open as many as possible. So one of the things that I was mentioning to your professor was that um, we're hoping to create some more direct pipelines in Southern California, like Coachella Valley and Imperial Valley, into the into Berkeley in order to create new teachers, new nurses, somebody who is a nurse, um, uh, in order to be able to serve communities. Yeah. So thank you for that question. Yeah. Is it yeah. over yet? Is it over yet? Uh, not yet. Not yet. We're almost there. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, no one knows about the workers in the Coachella Valley, but we know about Bad Bunny, right? And so, or Beyonce, or, uh, you know, 
the thing is, I love music festivals or I love festivals. I like art, right? So we should all have this. The, the thing though, is that I think many communities in California are stuck in trying to get tourism dollars because it creates tax dollars because we have a really unequal tax system. Um, I think in order to, so, so the answer is no, it hasn't brought more attention. I don't know if it made it worse, uh, but it certainly hasn't necessarily made it better. What has made it better is that many, many communities have been electing much more progressive legislators for Sacramento. And so we have uh, increased wages, we have increased resources uh, or benefits. They're not nowhere near enough and it hasn't done anything to affect housing prices. But ultimately that's, I think, what we're gonna get at. Question of that? Yeah. 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 That's a good question. I don't know. That's kind of. I don't. I mean, I got lucky. I think that's what it was. I mean, I was. I was a boy with the tie. Uh, there's obviously my mother went to college for a year before she had to cross the border. That kind of cultural capital transferred over to me. The way that I was dressed probably meant that I was treated a bit better than some of the other kids. My father is Mexican American and he spoke English and we had citizenship and we had public housing. So those kind of provisions that kind of like barely enough, I used to say that I come from nothing. That's not true. I come from almost nothing, right? But like that almost made the difference. And then in addition to that, you know, as a gay little boy in the 1990s, you don't have a lot of friends. Now it's like amazing to see these kids like waving the flag. Like I wish, you know, now I'm a little too old for makeup or tattoos, but maybe, maybe not, right? But when I was a kid, that wasn't the case. So I had to make friends with books and that allowed me to become a thinker uh, through books, right? We're all thinkers, but it's whether or not it gets recognized by institutions. So I, I don't know the answer, like all my family struggles, you know, and a lot of my neighbors struggle and it's really odd for me to go to places in Coachella. I'm, I'm very much not of that place uh, now. So I think a lot of it is chance, yeah. And the idea is we need to get rid of chance, right? That's it. Yeah, okay. Great question though. Hi, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, I guess I, I was curious your thoughts on sort of the current moment that we're For in sure. with all the, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of labor action yeah. that's happening. Sure. I haven't heard much about what's going on in agriculture. Yeah. What's sure. the status of the yeah. one So, the For sure. So California, so, Agriculture, so the United States has a you know, fairly tepid uh, pro-labor uh, law from the 1930s has uh, provided recognition for union, um, uh, union rights and union strikes and so forth. The, there were two groups that were left out. Uh, those were domestic workers and farm workers. And they were primarily because they were black Americans in the South and then they were afraid that it was gonna disrupt Jim Crow. So again, this is another example of how if you want to study this, you would have to study multi multiracial history. Uh, California is the only state other than New York now, and maybe a couple more, that have labor rights in the states. So, so it's really hard to organize if you don't have any labor rights. So that's, that includes Arizona, Texas, Florida, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, maybe Maryland, I'm not sure, Maryland, perhaps. Um, so now the labor law in California is not particularly strong. And that means that when strikers or when workers try to get union recognition, many of them will get fired. A few of the leaders will get terrorized and they'll make everyone kind of quiet down. And then the grower will get kind of penalized, but it will never be enough to actually get a union, a union vote. Uh, so the UFW recently pressured Newsom to change those laws. So I think right now we're in the moment like for those chemistry folks here, when you're boiling water, right? There's a point where like the, the, the heat of the water stops and it just kind of plateaus. And then eventually it, it, it becomes like a vapor. Does that make sense? I, this is high school, but we're in the plateau right now. I think it's been heated, heated, heated. Right now, I think people are being organized. And I think in the next year or two, you'll see strike after strike and union recognition throughout California. So, yeah. But, you know, if I'm wrong, I, I hope I'm not wrong. Yeah. Well, the we have, Folks from Zoom asking yeah. you some questions. Okay. 
Uh, we have Regina who is saying, I know the Coachella Valley was struck very hard during the pandemic. Did you interview any farm workers about how they felt about being essential workers? Were they nervous to work during this time? Yeah, I, that's a great question. So I, I didn't uh, interview. I was in Berkeley. Um, and so this is actually, it, this is something to think about as an academic who does work on poverty and race and labor and movements. Because I live an everyday life that's very, very, very remote from the very topic that I study. Now my family lives in Coachella. I have some family still works in the fields, but I was in the Val in, in Berkeley in faculty housing, right? Watching from afar the, 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 the marginalization that was taking place. What I did do is that I, I re-interviewed all the people I interviewed and I asked them what they thought about what was happening in the Coachella Valley. I did an interview farm workers in part because I didn't have a relationship with them and it, it seemed unethical to arrive at their, in their homes at, at a moment of duress. Uh, plenty of journalists though were doing that and they were trying to promote the stories. And so there are a lot of stories in the LA Times. So for, so for the student, I wrote an article on this that kind of summarizes that and then tries to pivot and show what would be needed in order to be essential workers. Uh, but yeah, in the town right next to where I grew up, um, there's a nice Catholic church. Uh, two priests died. One died, right, from exposure to COVID and the other one was replaced and then he died. Uh, from, from COVID too. Several of the deacons, uh, some of my former high school students' parents. Um, and then the thing is that COVID wasn't just about the, the way that you, whether or not you died or whether or not you were affected. It's also the ways in which, you know, you were stuck in, in trailer parks, right? Or in tiny little apartments. And I grew up without AC as a kid and it gets to 120 degrees there. And so you're doing uh, school remotely, uh, it, oftentimes as an English language learner, in spaces that are already cramped to begin with. So, so the impact had multiple layers to it. And then there are a couple of folks asking you about your book. So Paula says, what was one of the worst experiences in Coachella you heard of that triggered you to write a book about your hometown struggles and inequalities? And then Nikki says, do you have your next book in mind, considered <laughs> expanding on the topic or pivoting to another related topic? Well, that last question, you know, it's like an administrator. <laughs> you finished, Christian, what's your next thing? <laughs> so, uh, so, so two things. So, so um, the first one about what is some of the experience. So I was a high school teacher, as I mentioned, and we had some amazing teachers at this high school. We had great teachers teaching English, teaching Spanish literature, Chicano studies. Then it was Mexican-American studies in that region. We had incredible uh, uh, principals uh, who coming out of this movement. I ended up interviewing my principal who was part of this effort. Uh, and, and I thought it was amazing. You know, it was a great lecture. We did a lot of cool things. Uh, but every morning I would drive past fields with their parents working in the fields, making poverty wages. Uh, we knew that their housing was substandard. There was sewage coming out of restrooms. There was arsenic and water. Fires were common because of the electrical wire systems were not great. Um, this is in 2006, 2007, 2008. This is a time of massive board uh, rates, immigration rates that were happening throughout the Southwest. I don't know if you remember some, some of this was just like everywhere. And there's a real sense of, of like, you're doing good work in one space, but you see all the work that needs to take place elsewhere. And for me, this was a reminder that uh, all movements require everyone. So if you're gonna be a nurse, if you're gonna be a, a, a musician, if you're gonna be a writer, if you're gonna be an engineer, you, you need to offer this to others. It's not just yours. And so for me, that, that provided the opportunity for me to, to wanna be a writer and to be able to tell this story because that's a contribution itself. I see the second project, I do, I have a second project. Uh, um, and it's mostly because of this. And so the question, so it's gonna be called 2065, that's it. So just look at the number, think of the number 2065, and it's a century after the UFW. And so the question is, what does agriculture need to look like in order for us to have the UFW's vision in the context of climate change and mass global migration? And so, so, so it'll be like interdisciplinary, this is where interdisciplinary makes so much sense. And it's an idea of trying to leverage as many community stories as possible to kind of map out a report. Okay. Um, and so those are the two. two. Yes. Right. 
So we have Professor Ruth Miller, who yes. is asking the photographer, Dorothy Lang, and later yes. to a lesser degree, Ansel Adams, brought a lot of attention to California agricultural workers in the early, early 20th century. Yes. Do you have, um, do you know of current visual documentarians who are documenting contemporary situation? For sure. There's a, there's a photographer named David Bacon who has been uh, photographing farm workers both in Mexico and the United States um, and is rooted in the UFW. That, uh, and right now, I think he is working with a few people on an exhibition on California farm workers, especially in the southern part, like San Bernardino. Is anyone here from San Bernardino? Yeah, everyone's from there. Yeah. yeah, so David Baker would be a good one. I have a, I have another question for you. Okay. Uh, my question would be, what advice would you offer like college students or young activists interested in studying and participating in labor and social justice movements today, given the insights you've gained from your research? For sure. That's a great question. So what do uh, I think that it's important? So uh, three things are usually common from the people I interviewed. One is courage. Another one is discipline and the third is purpose. I would say that you need to begin with whatever is you. So do whatever moves you, uh, do whatever you think you're here to do, but then you have to be fundamentally uh, generous with that. Um, so you can't keep it and yet it has to be shared. And you just have to trust that other people are doing it too. The, the, our freedom is not ours to decide. It is something that we collectively produce. And so often, so just know that you do your part, that is you paying your dues. Other people will do their part and hopefully we'll get to the place where we want to get to. Yeah. So um, a question, sort of a question yeah. comment um, in terms of how do you see the indigenous population that is migrating now, yeah. for example, you know, in the Salinas Valley, yeah. um, the of the Teco Tree, yeah. uh, in um, the Napa Valley, yeah. the Maya people, from yeah. Yucatan and in Coachella, uh, predominantly in the Pura Pachas, Pura Pachas. and you know, Termal, yeah. and Mecca. Yeah, you know your geography really. That's fantastic. I love it. This is, yeah. So, how, how do you do you interview the people and in your experience and on that creating a, a similar but different movement? In, 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 in For different? sure. So, some of these. So this is a huge conversation that's now taking place on organizing efforts. Uh, there are multiple organizations that are statewide or region specific that are about indigenous farm workers in California. A lot of it is about fighting racism that is coming from Mexican Americans or Mexican ethnic Mexican mestizos. Uh, it's often about being able to highlight uh, languages that are being either uh, delegated as uh, as sub languages or simply not recognized. Period. And, and it's also that some of these histories are very distant from people's migration patterns. Uh, so there, so two things. So, so for instance, the Pichel and the Budapichel families are coming late 80s, principally, and maybe early 1990s. Because of the immigration laws that are taking place in the United States, an indigenous migrant oftentimes means incredible high rates of undocumented status. And that means that they're going to be facing a different set of challenges than perhaps my family who's Mexican-American or my mother's family who comes before her Um I think this is one of the significances of ethnic studies that is recognizing the multiraciality of people and the needing to foreground the most marginalized in your community in order to be able to shape a politics that does not leave them out. Um, that said, you know, as a historian, I kind of end around 1990. Right? And this is where a lot of these migration, many of these issues are, are developing. So this is also an area for more research to be done. Yeah. Yes. All right, that takes us to time, yeah. exactly. Yeah. All right, everybody, good job. And do join us at our next Social Justice Speaker Series event on November 20th, 1245, that will be back in the Diablo room where we will be hosting somebody else from UC Berkeley, Shani Shea, director for our incarceration to college. So join us then, we'll see you. And we will be next door next week at 11, Monday, November 13th for a teach-in on the situation in Palestine. Join us right next door at 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we will be sending the information out 
to you all. See you then. And that'll be via Zoom. That'll be our three college campuses simultaneously hosting this evening. See you then. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank <laughs> you.